fun to be in the middle of the ocean with no resources at all Fantastic. and many And then to come back to school and pass on this kind of experience and the students passion. are interested in the fact that you've have some experience of where you're talking about. For a busy teacher, it's a dream come true. One afternoon you're teaching that difficult class. Anything? The next you're hauling up the sails of a 120-foot sailing boat bound for the high Arctic. Head of Geography Gary Doyland and science teacher and South Asian dancer Subha Subramaniam went on the first Cape Farewell voyage to Spitsbergen in the Arctic Circle in May 2003. Mike Vingo, ex-head of science and now science college manager at Riddlesdown High School, went on the second Cape Farewell expedition in September 2004. On both voyages, artists, scientists, teachers and filmmakers were brought together to draw attention to the impact of global warming on the remote northern islands of Svalbard in the Norwegian Arctic. The artists were there to record the changing environment, the scientists were looking at the change in the ocean currents and the Arctic ecosystem. And the teachers were there to create new curriculum materials for science and geography and present them to camera. Because it's a frozen beach. This is a really barren, extreme landscape. The glacier itself is created by the snow falling in the high areas behind, packing down consolidating the squeezing air and moisture out of the snow so it becomes blue ice and that blue ice travels quite slowly maybe up to 300 meters a year maximum. It was interesting that I had more to give than I actually really thought I had in the beginning and I talked about movement of ice and how glasses could form up in the mountains, how it was creating the landforms that were visible in the valleys and subsequently start developing some of the teaching materials that were going to go into Geography 21. Well, the DVD that went with that, I actually helped to present, and some of the work that I was doing on the boat actually appears on that DVD. The top end of the Gulf Stream, the Norwegian current, is allowing us to actually go through these fjords and experience these extreme conditions. Personally, the thing that I found really exciting being on that boat was doing the physically doing the experiments with the scientists. It's not an opportunity that that as a teacher I've had for a long time. It was great because a lot of the time I was doing it as the experiments were happening. So you know I was helping to do the plankton sampling, getting my hands cold and wet and freezing cold and then having to explain to the camera whilst doing all of this. <laughs> Look at all this junk. The box itself is junk. The tourists haven't left this behind. It's all just washed up on the beach. The worst one is this fishing line. Birds, seals, all sorts My purpose really there was to bring the professional scientists down to a level that I know 15, 16 year olds would be able to understand. Maybe to look at some of the things that they were doing and try and develop experiments that, well, I'd like to think 10 or 11 year olds could understand. The sea with an iceberg in it. The sea warming up the sea connected to a glacier and the glacier melting. I'm going to make a mark on each of them to see where the water level is now. And then, as I said, we'll have another look in an hour or so. I think it's important that children understand the ideas about climate change. When you're talking about global warming, it's look at this, look at this chart, look at this data, look at this evidence. And you want to be able to do something with the children. You want to be able to, to show them something happening. The Nordelic is schooner rigged. 100 foot long and quite narrow, it's only 20 foot wide. Nice big bowsprit, frighteningly large bowsprit. Having sailed out of Tromso, my watch finished and I was the first watch and went below, woke up the next morning to fall out of the bed because uh, we were rocking into a nice 4-6 uh, um, wind. <laughs> The ship was rocking very well. It was great getting up, I coped with that. It was when I bent over, I thought I was going to puke in my boots. My sea legs aren't the best in the world, so the, the, one of the worst memories I have, in a way, is the seasickness that I suffered. I remember being in my cabin and in bed and horizontal for about two days and not being able to keep anything down. Last night, we went through an area of seas called the Devil's Dance Floor. Now it's called the Devil's Dance Floor apparently because of the Gulf Stream bringing the currents in from the south and the northeasterly winds and where they meet you have this huge big turbulent seas and because of that 
I have been very, very ill. As we left any kind of civilization behind, it didn't occur to me for one minute how awful it would be in this boat as the, as the boat is peeled over at 45 degrees and there's a force seven gale or something blowing and all these guys on the boat and guys and ladies on the boat they're all oh this is fabulous fun isn't it and I was thinking this is awful. On the third day out enough people had come round that they were all up on deck the weather had moderated and we got dolphins whales popping up out of the water amazing and then picking up an iceberg blue ice floating in a creamy blue ocean, white capped, just unbelievable, like a tabletop, just sitting on the water. And you just think, that's only one seventh of it. There's another six sevenths down below. That was fantastic. I remember one of the first things I got excited about was arriving at Bear Island. And we basically couldn't get onto the island because it was surrounded by so much ice somebody spotted a polar bear. And this polar bear had actually got off the island and was actually swimming towards the boat. And it was the most amazing thing. And all of a sudden, all my seasickness, all my feeling ill, all my confusion about what time it was just went away because for the first time I'd seen a polar bear. As we uh, went into Hornsund, it had been snowing overnight, so the decks had snow on. There was ice floating in the water and it looked just so inhospitable. We had a lovely night, actually, one night when, when I stayed on the boat. The scientists were going to do a plankton trawl. So the plankton trawl was brought in, and uh, I, I was over the moon with the stuff that was being brought out. For the scientists, they're dealing with these things every day, and so they get kind of blasé about it. So one of the things I was doing was hopefully making obvious to people just how exciting these little things were. These are comb jellies. They're a sort of circular bag of animal with a mouth at the bottom and lots and lots of tiny little bristles that form rows down the side. And those bristles wave and move the thing along. And these two here, these are relatives of snails. They're generally referred to as sea butterflies because of the way they move. And then this big fella in the middle, who's really very impressive, there's something big and black in the middle of him. I have a feeling it might be his last meal. He feeds on the little uh, snails. He's got four like suckers on the top of his head and he grabs hold of them, bites in and sucks them dry. All right, we have our uh, microscope attached to a camera so we can see things clearly and other people can see as well. It was, you know, as far as I was concerned, as excited as seeing the polar bears. Of course I'm excited by the polar bears, but the plankton was just as good and just as enthralling. Biology being my specialism within science teaching, being in that environment amongst all that wildlife, like getting so close to the walruses, like listening to the sounds of the bearded seals, like seeing the polar bear, like looking at the birds, the whales, all of this for me was just the most amazing experience because I was in amongst these creatures I teach about all the time. One of the wonderful things about going to a place like Svalbard is that there's no vegetation to obscure the landscape. OK, the snow does, but in fact snow is quite useful because it helps pick out the lines in the rocks. I trained as a geologist originally, and I have to say that arriving there and seeing some of the rock formations, the folds, the bends, the peaks, the arets, are all part of the interest. And you can see literally how the Earth has moved in the last 150 million years to create the landforms that we were walking on. It's just quite unbelievable, fantastic. These are Mesozoic rocks, so about 200 million years old, and they've been folded so that one edge of the rock, that spire sticking up in the sky, is the vertical limb of an anticline. It's a very ice sharpened peak. You can see it's got a really clear, sharp arete edge down to the front, and that arete goes away across the back and runs parallel to the glacier in the foreground. Are you ready, Val? Yeah? Are you ready? The whole idea of having scientists on board was to do experiments and gather data that gave us some evidence about what was going on in those oceans. Primarily, it was about looking at ocean currents and how the change in ocean currents could have quite catastrophic consequences. 10 metres, it 
you get this tongue of Atlantic water sticking in. It's a good one or two degrees warmer than this. It's actually the warm Atlantic water that originates in the Gulf Stream, south of Florida. Now, I have a bit of difficulty in visualising uh, the ocean currents not mixing, because water just mixes. So I'm going to try and set up an experiment which will demonstrate the fact that water of different temperature and different saltiness won't in fact mix. As the scientists are collecting data to find out whether they can actually see if there are any changes uh, to the Gulf Stream, what I was trying to do was to, 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 to make models so that I could show kids exactly what's going on in the ocean. This is cold, salty water from the depths of the Atlantic. And it's quite difficult, really, because you find yourself in a boat in the middle of nowhere. There, there are no shops. This one is warmer and less salty, and that's the North Atlantic drift, the Gulf Stream. So you're left with what's on board the boat to try and use to, to, to make the models. And finally here, this is the glacier water. Very cold, no salt at all. OK, so there you have it. Three types of water. Uh, and they're not mixing. But the concern is that global warming will change their relationships between these layers of waters and they all become mixed up, which would mean the middle one, the one that keeps Britain warm, just shutting down. It's very different talking to a, a camera. It's not something I've done before. Um, and what I'm used to is having 30 children in front of you and you know whether you're getting your lesson right or wrong by just looking at their faces. You know, you can tell whether they understand, whether they're enthused, whether they want to take part, and you can tell whether they're bored stiff. Well, of course, in this circumstance, there isn't that instant feedback. So you find yourself talking to a camera and kind of hoping it's all right, really. Cheers. <laughs> The map was drawn in 1984, so yeah. where would the ice have been then? Has it changed my views? Yes, it's made me much more conscious of what's happening. It's about three nautical miles that it has been retreated. When we came back, I went off to a conference at the RDS, uh, which was being organised as a revision for A-level students. And uh, the examiners were making statements like, uh, there will be a climatic change in southeastern Britain, and we will have a Mediterranean climate. and yet that didn't match up with some of the things that we were finding out about in Svalbard. National curriculum has become somewhat of a straitjacket. You must teach this, you must teach this, you must teach this. And, and it stops science teachers exploring and, and changing and finding things out, playing to what the children are interested in. Having been to the Arctic and having experienced some of these things I was teaching them about, especially when it came to global warming and, you know, food chains, food webs, wildlife, I think made a difference to the pupils I was teaching because it made it a little bit more real to them. It made them realise that it wasn't just something they read in textbooks, it wasn't just pictures that they looked at, but somebody they knew, somebody who was teaching them, had first-hand experience of this. The kids want to know about it. So yes, there's been an impact on my teaching, but it's, it's more child-led, if you know what I mean. The kids have come to me and made me talk to them about what I've seen. I think in an ideal world, every teacher should have an opportunity to go and revisit the passion for their subject. Absolutely. Every teacher will probably agree with me. The administration, the day-to-day -day running of your lessons, your planning, takes away sometimes from the passion that you feel for your subject. Now, I know it's easier said than done sometimes because releasing teachers for any length of time is very difficult for schools, for head teachers. I understand all of that. But I think the long-term benefits of that are huge. <laughs>